Welcome everyone uh, to the Davidson and Company 2021 annual tax update. Uh, my name is Les Fabian. I'm a tax partner here at Davidson and Company. Uh, I'll be your host for the session today. Uh, we have a few very interesting topics to, uh, to go over with you today with the various changes in tax laws. But before we get there, I just wanted to send our thoughts and, and, um, and uh, consider all the people affected by the floods and the flood recovery. Uh, we hope the days coming up will will be improving and just to send our thoughts out to you and uh, and so people are staying safe and and keeping well uh, needless to say it's been a tough year for bc between covid and the summer fires and the rain so uh, here's hoping uh, the days and weeks up ahead are, are going to improve and hopefully this time next year we'll see all of you in person at our our next session uh, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, slide movement. One second, just some technical difficulties. Jeez, folks, it's, uh, you know, it always happens when you're ready to go. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them through the uh, Q&A function in the Zoom. Uh, we'd be happy to see them and uh, hopefully we can answer them for you today. Uh, as well, there will be a survey posted along with uh, a link to your PD certificate, uh, as well as the slides and a video of the uh, video email to you. Um, please also note the next session we'll have is uh, January 12th uh, for some annual regulatory and TSX update. The, the agenda today, and before I get too far, we have a number of speakers today. So Jamie Nguyen, who is a uh, Canadian tax partner who works with many of our private equity clients, will be talking about uh, sales tax issues in the new digital world with the increase in online purchases and streaming. Uh, a lot of uh, new rules that are going to cut, kick in on those. Uh, Namir Halak, who joined us recently as our U.S. tax principal, will be talking about some of the U.S. tax issues to look for in 2022. Uh, Howard Chang, our Canadian tax principal, works with a lot of our international clients and public companies. Uh, we'll be going over some of the new rules for uh, cross-border financing. Uh, we also have Mark Weston with us, who is our valuations partner. Uh, he'll be talking about some of the impacts COVID has put on the com private company valuations, which uh, in an, uh, ultimately has an impact on some of the tax issues you may encounter. And I will be presenting uh, the last topic, which would be the, the new mandatory disclosure rules that will be potentially kicking in and are just at proposal stage right now. Um, so out following that, we'll have a draw. We will be giving uh, away uh, $300 Starbucks gift certificate. So please stay tuned. And uh, without further ado, we will get started with Jamie and um, Canadian sales tax. Thanks, Les, for that. Um, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, hoping next year you guys will all be here in person and we'll be able to present to you guys um, in the same room. Uh, so today, uh, my topic is on uh, Canadian sales tax issues for the digital world. Um, you know, sales tax is one of those topics or those those taxes, I think, that doesn't get much fanfare. Uh, usually it's more income tax, but, um, you know, with Oh, I'd say over the last two years, you know, when it comes to GST audits, that's probably the most prevalent uh, type of audit we've seen um, in our office, at, at least for me anyways, is um, GST related um, matters. So with that, um, let's get into it. So um, I'll, I'll first kind of explain, uh, I think, how we got to these new rules uh, with respect to digital products and services, just so you guys have a bit of a primer. Um, so in the fall economic statement, uh, finance proposed several changes um, to the GST and HST system to ensure that GST was being charged fairly on digital products and services. Um, currently right now, you know, if, if a good, a physical good comes into Canada, the CBSA is able to collect the GST on those physical goods, on the importation of those goods. And so there's not usually much leakage there when it comes to physical goods coming into Canada. But again, obviously, with the concept of digital products and services, it's much more difficult to track. So these new rules um, 
that were implemented earlier this year basically um, force um, certain parties to collect uh, GST in a transaction. And the, and, and the, the targets are non-resident vendors, so the person actually selling it, uh, what we call distribution platform operators and accommodation platform operators. So what are these existing rules? So again, this, these rules target specifically non-resident vendors, uh, at least one of the parties uh, involved. So for Canadian residents, for most of you guys that are watching here uh, that are GST registrants, if you're a Canadian corporation or a Canadian resident, you know that once you are dealing with a taxable supply, you just have to simply register for GST and begin charging GST on your Canadian-based sales. Uh, with non-resident vendors, it's a little bit differently uh, uh, legislated. And the non-resident vendors essentially need to be carrying on business in Canada before they're required to register and collect GST on their Canadian sales. And so this is a fact-based analysis. Usually it looks at how much presence the non-resident vendor has in Canada. If there's really no presence in Canada other than having a Canadian customer, usually that's not enough to be carrying on a business in Canada for GST purposes. So what was happening under these, the old rules is a lot of non-resident vendors uh, took the position that they were not carrying on business in Canada. So they said, well, you know, I, I'm just selling, I'm just drop shipping uh, a product to someone in Vancouver. I have no other presence in Canada. I, I don't have to register for GST nor charge GST on the sale. So technically that, that was correct, right? Under series guidelines. Um, and so what happens though, is when the, the vendor is not required to charge GST to the consumer, the consumer is actually supposed to self-assess the GST. So you're supposed to voluntarily pay this GST when you see that the vendor has not charged you GST for these digital goods and services. So as, as you can imagine, that wasn't happening, right? The consumers were obviously not self-assessing. They just simply ignored it or they, they weren't aware of the rules. But you know, had they self-assessed, theoretically, there should should be no tax leakage, right? If, if the consumer had self-assessed, paid the GST, the Canadian government would have got their GST and everyone would have been happy. So the government looked at this and said, yeah, we're, there, there's no self, the non-resident vendors aren't registering and collecting GST. The consumers are not self-assessing. So clearly there's a leakage of tax here. Um, and in 2019 alone, they said there was 247 million of revenues that were lost on untaxed digital services. So the response to this was to implement new rules that basically forced these non-resident vendors to uh, register and collect GST on their Canadian-based sales. So under the, the, the old rules or the existing rules, we have what we call a subdivision D registration. So for most of you that are watching this video, if you're a registrant, most likely you are a subdivision D registrant. So you know, your parent, you know, you're say a Canadian resident corporation you have taxable sales, you, you collect GST on your sales and you claim ITCs. So now for these non-resident vendors, we have what we call a subdivision E registration. And you'll, you'll commonly refer, hear me refer to subdivision E or what the CRA is also coining as the simplified uh, GST reporting system. So effective July 1st, 2021, so earlier this summer, uh, non-resident vendors can't simply say we're not carrying on business in Canada. Even if you say you're not carrying on business in Canada under the subdivision D rules, you now need to then consider if you're selling digital products and services. And once you are, you're basically in the subdivision D, sorry, the subdivision E registration system. So there, there's still that small supplier test rule. So if non-residents have less than $30,000, for example, in sales, usually you don't need to register and collect GST. So let's go through some of the technical details of what happens in a subdivision E registration or, or, or type of transaction. So you really have three parties to the three items in the transaction. You have a specified non-resident supplier, you have a specified supply, and you have a specified Canadian recipient. And I'll go through each of those in a little bit more detail. So for the specified non-resident supplier, um, if somehow you are able to escape, so you just imagine, for example, a US resident vendor. So let's say they're selling, uh, let's say streaming services, they're selling uh, mobile apps or, or streaming services to a Canadian consumer. So let's say they say, well, I'm, I don't have any presence in Canada other than the fact that my customer 
is located in Canada. So I somehow escaped subdivision D registration. Um, the instant that you are selling these digital products and services, you are now defined as a specified non-resident supplier. So this first condition, you're pretty much met if, if you're a non-resident vendor selling these, these types of products. The second part of the transaction is what we call a specified supply. So supply is just a fancy word for a sale of the transaction, right? So under subdivision E, this is a narrow tax base compared with the subdivision D. Subdivision D kind of covers everything, including the sale of physical goods. Whereas under these new rules, this only looks at really digital products and services. So intangible personal property and services. So most common examples, online video, music streaming. So you think of Netflix, Spotify, you know, online concerts, mobile apps, eBooks, video games, and traditional services, legal and, and, and health. So just services in general. And I'll talk a little bit more about services um, in a couple of slides. So, you know, if, if you were following the news over the last year or so, you always refer to this, you always hear this term Netflix tax. This is essentially what this is, is the Netflix tax. Although you'll quickly see it can really affect more um, vendors and not just uh, companies that are providing streaming services. So if, a question that had, had come up, you know, while we were looking at this was, you know, if you're a vendor, a non-resident vendor, you're selling tangible goods, um, can you simply uh, say, well, I don't want to register under subdivision D and I want to do the simplified method. You can't do that. It, once, you, once you fall into the subdivision D or the existing rules, that's, what, that's where you're going to fall into. You can't just opt into this, this new simplified regime. Um, and the third part of the transaction is what we call a specified Canadian recipient. So again, the first, the first two is you have the supplier or the vendor. Second part is you have a supply or a sale. And this third one is you have a, a specified Canadian recipient. If all three conditions are met, basically GST applies on the transaction. So the interesting thing here is the, the GST won't apply on all transactions. Essentially what needs to happen for the non-resident vendor to charge GST is that the recipient or the Canadian consumer cannot be a registrant uh, for GST purposes. So it's basically targeting, these new rules are targeting business to consumer transactions, not necessarily business to business transactions. So, and I think the logic behind that there is if, a biz, if it was a business to business transaction and the recipient was a GST registrant, they would have claimed ITCs anyway. So really the, the government's not gonna be in pocket or out of pocket. And the other condition that needs to be met for a recipient, uh, a specified Canadian recipient, is that the recipient's usual place of business needs to be in Canada. So if you're outside of Canada, then GST won't apply. And that makes sense because we, as most of you guys know, we have our zero rating rules where if you make sales to non-residents of Canada, usually GST doesn't apply. And when it comes to the, the percentage, the GST or the HST rate, it's gonna be based on the place of residence the usual place of residence for the Canadian consumer. So if you're in Ontario, uh, the consumers in Ontario, then they'll charge the 13% HST rate. So let's uh, kind of go over one of the parts of this legislation that I think a lot of people are going to get caught into uh, without really realizing it. And that's when it comes to services. So, you know, again, the, if, you, if, you follow, if you've been following the news, you keep hearing about this Netflix tax, Airbnb was, is, it was kind of dragged into this as well. Um, but the, the, the key here to me, one of the big keys is services. So um, non-resident service providers could potentially get caught under these new rules um, without even re really realizing it. So I'll give you a simple example here. If you imagine a, a U.S. consulting company um, that's providing services remotely to a Canadian consumer. So you have a U.S. consulting company in, say, Los Angeles, um, and they're just providing consulting services remotely. It could even be legal or accounting services. Let's go through the three conditions to see if all three of those are met. So the consultant probably isn't carrying on a business in Canada under the existing subdivision D rules uh, because they have no presence in Canada. So by that definition, they are a specified non-resident supplier. Um, the second condition, do you have a specified supply? Well, you know, a service consulting service is normally going to be a taxable supply. So in that case, um, you have a specified supply. And then the third condition is, if the Canadian customer is not registered and the usual place of business is in Canada, then you do have a, a specified Canadian recipient. So if you think of a situation where that consultant is providing services to 
an individual for personal use, um, you're going to have GST apply on that. So in that case, the U.S. consultant would actually need to register and charge GST to the consumer. My guess of how a lot of people are going to uh, be able to avoid GST is where, say, the consulting services is pro being provided business to business and the recipient is a GST registrant. But just be aware of those potential uh, traps. So what are some other key features of this new regime? Because I keep saying it's simplified. It's a simplified system. So when it comes to the tax compliance, um, I, I've kind of noted some of the key points I thought were, were really important. So the, the, the registration under the simplified system or the subdivision E is, is, is quite easy. Uh, Siri has a questionnaire online. You just kind of answer the questions. And then at the end, it'll actually spit out an answer if you have to be registered under the new system. Uh, the, the sales tax or, or, or the remittances can actually be calculated in US dollars or euros, whereas under the traditional system, you can only remit, as you guys know, in Canadian dollars. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, GST registered consumers will actually be exempt um, from GST under this new system. Uh, there'll be no ITCs permitted, uh, and I'll get to that on the next slide. I'll elaborate on that. And no security needs to be posted if there's no permanent establishment in Canada. Whereas under the traditional rules, if you're a non-resident vendor, you actually would normally have to post security with the CRA to open up the account. So ITCs and rebates. So for most of you that are familiar with the GST system, you know that when you incur GST on your expenditures, you'll get that back as input tax credits if you're engaged in commercial activities. Uh, you, so usually you're, you're tax neutral when it comes to GST um, on your expenditures. Under this new system, though, the vendors will not be permitted to claim uh, any input tax credits. And I think the logic there is they probably don't have a, a ton of expenses. And so therefore, there's really no need to give them that those ITC. So this really simplifies the compliance for these non-resident vendors. Um, there are some exceptions for claiming ITCs if there's like bad debts or sales adjustments, but for the most part, uh, there's no ITCs. So uh, up, up to this point, I've been talking about non-resident vendors as being what, one of the parties that are affected by these new rules. And another party that's being affected by this is what we call distribution platform operators or DPOs. So what was happening again is, you know, a lot of these non-resident vendors were making sales into Canada, they were often using these third party websites uh, or, or these distribution platforms for making these sales. And again, GST was not being collected. So finance kind of looked at this and said, yeah, we think the non-resident vendors are responsible, but hey, we also think that these distribution platform operators or these DPOs are also responsible because they're basically the ones that are putting the transaction together. They're the middleman in this particular situation. So, you know, under the, the, the definition, a DPO is a person that controls or sets the essential elements of a transaction between a third party vendor and the purchaser. So companies that list, you know, services for sale on their website, um, they do all the delivery, the payment conditions, they have fulfillment houses in, in Canada, they will basically be DPOs. And it, as many of you are watching this, you're probably thinking of the classic example, Amazon, right? And this is, this rule was really targeted at, at, at companies like Amazon. Because again, what was happening is you had non-resident vendors that were selling on, on the Canadian website of Amazon and not charging GST. And, and finance looked at Amazon and said, well, we think you guys should also be responsible for this too, right? And not just put the onus on the non-resident vendors. So under these new rules, basically what's gonna happen for these DPOs, which is effective July 1st, 2021, is that it deems the DPO to actually make the sale if the vendor is not registered. So you can't, the, it, and I think the logic behind that is finance is saying, okay, well, it'd be difficult for us to go after the non-resident vendor if they're not registered, they're not collecting GST, but hey, if they're using this third-party website, like an Amazon, we're going to go after you guys as, as the DPO. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about uh, the, this third party that's, that's involved in these new rules, but there's a parallel rule for accommodation platform operators, um, which also those forces those particular operators to collect GST on behalf of the vendors for short-term short accommodations. So a classic example would be like Airbnb. So again, Airbnb in this case would be, would have to collect and, uh, sorry, charge and collect and remit GST um, on those sales. So when it comes to the DPOs, their collection responsibilities, if, you know, I was talking about the digital products and services, if, if the DPOs are, are selling 
digital products and services through their websites, for example, um, the, the DPO is deemed to collect it. So it doesn't even matter if the non-resident vendor is already registered under the simplified system. It, the, the rules deem the DPO to collect it. And so the DPO actually has a responsibility to remit this to the CRA. Similarly, when it comes to the sale of tangible goods, um, if the goods are located in a Canadian fulfillment warehouse um, and those sales are made by a non-registered under the subdivision D, the traditional rules, non-resident vendor, um, the DPO is required to um, collect and remit that GST to the CRA. So other responsibilities, as you can imagine, since the DPO will now be responsible for uh, basically administering this GST on behalf of these vendors, they have a lot of responsibilities when it comes to tax compliance. So the DPOs actually have to notify the CRA um, if they're a storage service provider. So if they have fulfillment warehouses in Canada, they actually have to notify the CRA, CRA about that. They have to maintain records about their vendors that are using their platforms. Um, the DPOs will actually be jointly liable with uh, the DPOs will be jointly liable with the vendors for the collection of tax. Um, but there is a safe harbor rule if the DPO relied in good faith on information provided by the supplier. So if the supplier said, well, I am already a GST registrant, you don't need DPO, you don't need to worry about it. And the DPO relied on that, they could actually, uh, uh, that's your, your safe harbor rule essentially. And the DPOs will also have to file an information return um, at the end of every year that discloses information about the vendors and the and their sales. Um, my understanding is for 2021, they'll actually be exempt from this fund during that transition period. So this is a chart. I don't know if you guys can see it clearly on your screens. Um, this is just taken straight from the CRA on who uh, is required to uh, collect GST and remit the tax uh, because it does get a little bit confusing when you kind of see who's all involved. So uh, in, in summary, uh, when a DPO is not involved, so you have a non-resident vendor that's selling these digital products and services directly to the consumer, the non-resident vendor is the one that's required to collect GST um, and remit it to the CRA. When a DPO is involved, uh, if you are dealing with um, a non-resident vendor that's already registered under the old rules or the subdivision D rules, the non-resident vendor can actually collect and remit that tax directly to the CRA. In the, in the other two situations, which is number three and number four in this chart, um, the DPO is actually the one deemed to uh, collect uh, that GST and they have to actually remit that to the CRA. So the, up to this point, this, that's been the federal rules when it comes to the GST and the HST. Uh, as many of you guys know, BC also implemented very similar rules. Um, to ensure that PSD was being charged on these digital products and services. So effective April 1st, uh, BC implemented new rules that forces non-residents to uh, register for PST and charge GST, or sorry, PST on the sale of software and telecommun telecommunication services. Um, so if you're a non-resident, so someone outside of BC, um, a vendor, you're, you're accepting orders or selling or providing software or telecommunication services to BC residents and you're over that $10,000 small supplier threshold, you basically need to charge BC PST on those sales. And this will actually apply to both business to business and business to consumer sales. There's no exemption like there is on the federal side if you're a GST registrant. Uh, these are just the definitions, which I won't go through, uh, just to save some time on, on the definition of software and telecommunication services. Uh, but suffice to say, the BC ministry already came out and said, yeah, the sellers of digital products and services um, to consumers in BC, they'll likely get caught. They came out and basically said, yeah, ex expect there to be P BC PST on these uh, transactions. So, you know, common examples of software and telecommunica telecommunication services, you know, you have application software, system software, video games, mobile device apps, uh, you know, online streaming stuff, um, basically very similar to the, to the federal rules. Um, so, it, if you want to kind of see how these rules are kind of working in real life, uh, for those of you who have Netflix billings, go, go look at your, your, your past billing history and you'll see prior to April 2021, before any of the rules came in, there was no sales tax charge on your Netflix bill. So if you're getting charged $14.99, that's what you were paying. 
once April hit, if you look at your April uh, 2021 invoice, you'll see the BC PST now being charged on it. So starting on April, you'll see a 7% charge being added to that, to that, to that $14.99 amount, for example. And then when the federal rules kicked in in July, you'll now see that 5% kicked in for BC Res. So really now all the Netflix invoices, for example, have the 12% sales tax being charged. Um, when it comes to a DPO example, a real life example is Amazon, obviously it's a classic example. Uh, they actually implemented what they, they coined their marketplace tax collection program uh, in response to these new DPO rules. And it basically is telling their vendors that are using their platform, hey, Amazon's now responsible for cal calculating, collecting and remitting the sales tax on your behalf. So if you, if, if you fall under the MTC program rules, you basically, uh, having Amazon collect this GST on your behalf. So if the vendor, for example, does not have a GST number, the product's being purchased on the Canadian website of Amazon, and the products are being shipped to and from a Canadian address, you now fall under Amazon's MTC program, which is basically the DPO rules, and Amazon will actually be required to uh, collect that GST on your behalf. So you'll probably see on a lot of your Amazon purchases that GST is almost always uh, applying now on, on these transactions. And uh, Amazon even has it in their FAQ section, there's no opting out of this MTC program. Uh, once you fall into this, Amazon has to collect it. So in summary, you know, with these new rules, you know, the non-resident vendors and the DPOs um, are, are going to really have to closely consider if um, sales tax registration is required and if they have to collect GST. Um, you know, uh, usually when we do this type of analysis, we'll just look at the subdivision D uh, rules. So we'll look at, see if they're carrying on business in Canada, but now there's a, a second part to this analysis and you have to now look at, see if, you know, there's a digital product and service and if you have a specified supply and a specified Canadian recipient now. So, and I think one of the big uh, takeaways I get from this legislation is, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of types of transactions that are caught under these rules that a lot of will blindside a lot of people. Like I said, you know, the consulting example where you have a U.S. resident consultant that's providing services in, in Canada. So just a reminder, you know, if you guys have any questions, uh, put them in, in, into the Q&A section and then we'll answer them at, at the end. Thank you. That's right, Jamie. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, great topic. I know it's going to be uh, something of interest for a while uh, with all the changes coming through and a lot of people using those services. So uh, I'm sure there'll be questions coming along. So next up, we have Namir Halak, who will be uh, talking about the top five tax issues to look for uh, in 2022 in the U.S. So uh, I'll let Namir take it from here. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Les, for the uh, intro. And thank you, everyone, for also uh, joining us virtually today. So my name is Namir Halak, U.S. Tax Principal with Davidson & Company. And look, the U.S. is on the road to economic recovery, but they're also looking for revenue-raising opportunities along the way. They want to help taxpayers get back on their feet, but they also need to be able to find ways to fund it. They want the tax dollars to make that happen. Please join me on this ride through America's economic recovery plan and the tax tolls we're gonna to see along the way. First, we're gonna start our car and we'll look around at where we are today. And immediately we see we are in an inflationary market and there's supply chain shortages around us. Next, we're gonna continue on that road of corporate recovery and the tax tolls for corporations. Number three, we're gonna look at the inbound and outbound exits on this road. Essentially, we're looking at changes to foreign companies doing inbound and outbound uh, business with the United States. For number four, we're going to shift our focus on the actual individual taxpayers driving on this road to America's economic recovery. What proposals are out there right now to help individual taxpayers, but also what levers are there to tax the wealthy along the way? And for number five, our final stop here, we're going to and on higher ground, we're gonna talk about the evolving regulatory landscape for the cannabis industry in the US and what's next for those businesses. Look, this last year and a half, this last year and a half of disruption, one of the outcomes of it has been uh, the rising prices at the gas pump, at the grocery store, and we're seeing this at BC and uh, elsewhere. And we're, we're, we're at a 30 year high uh, inflation. And there's an opportunity here for clients to hedge against these rising costs. 
Uh, one opportunity out there for taxpayers is to consider switching from FIFO method to a LIFO method. Assuming that they can achieve the LIFO conformity for both book and tax purposes, uh, what this essentially means is that at year end, they are allowing their ending inventory costs at inflationary numbers for, with a higher cost of goods sold and essentially reducing their taxable income against the historical cost, which would have been at the earlier inventory layer. On the other side of it, there is relief available for taxpayers that are already on the LIFO method. If you need to, if you're already on the LIFO method, you need to be able to replace your inventory at approximately the cost of the inventory at the beginning of the year. Now, if there's shortfall there, you're gonna have to pay the taxable income on that because you can't replenish your inventory fast enough. So there's essentially an excess of your prior period inventory. Look, there's some relief hopefully coming your way as well. There's a bipartisan letter right now from Congress essentially asking for Section 473 relief to allow taxpayers three years to replenish their inventory. Now, when we talk about Section 473, that's usually something that's reserved for like a trade embargo or some major international event. Uh, but advocates are pushing for this because they think that the supply chain interruptions that we have been seeing in the, through the pandemic would fit that bill. All right, we're gonna continue here on the road to economic recovery to talk about what it means for corporations. Look, on November 15th, Biden signed a $1.2 trillion uh, infrastructure bill. And when we talk about the infrastructure bill, this really is about the road to economic recovery. This is about hard infrastructure, building bridges and fixing roads. And with the infrastructure bill that was signed on November 15th, there's three specific tax changes that I wanna talk about. First one is the employee retention credit. So this has now, as a result of the infrastructure bill, had an early sunset for Q4. Now the employee retention credit was made to encourage businesses to keep employees on the payroll. Look, a lot of tax practitioners, myself included, were not expecting this to sunset a quarter early. Essentially what that means is any wages paid in this last quarter of 2021 are no longer eligible for this employee retention credit. But keep in mind, you can still get cash in your pockets within three years after your eligible period. So you have until 2024 to still make a claim for employee retention credit, despite the early sunset. The other one I want to talk about, though, is a recovery startup, which, by the way, doesn't get a lot of media attention. It doesn't get any buzz, actually. Um, this was legislated in early March of this year, March 2021. And essentially, this was there to get businesses up and running. Uh, to be eligible for it, the criteria was that you have to have annual gross receipts of less than a million dollars. You had to have at least one employee. And the third criteria was that you start your business after February 15, 2020. A very unfortunate timing, but very courageous timing to be starting a new business. So that being said, there's a lot of employers out there who might not be eligible for this employee retention credit in Q3. And now as a result of this not getting repealed in the infrastructure bill, you will be eligible for it in Q4. Guys, we're talking about $50,000 per quarter, actually a total of $100,000 of cash available as a credit if your business is eligible for this. So I hope you can talk to us if this is potentially gonna fit your criteria of business. The third change I wanna talk about with the infrastructure bill that was signed on November 15th is with regards to cryptocurrency. So there's new reporting requirements for brokers of digital assets and anybody who's also receiving digital assets in their trader business. Essentially, these now need to be reported on at 1099B, which is similar as stocks and securities. So they're treating these software dealers or cryptocurrency exchanges no different than they would have been treating a traditional uh, broker in that sense. The other piece too is they um, expanded the definition of cash payments. So with the IRS, anytime you have, for example, the Form 8300, anytime you have a cash payment that you're receiving, that's more than $10,000, you have to report that to the IRS within 15 days. So what they've done with this legislative change in the infrastructure bill is saying, well, now that definition of cash is also gonna include digital assets, cryptocurrencies. Onwards to the Build Better Act. So this is, now what we're talking about here with the Build Better Act, this is, the tax and spending bill. And this was passed on November 19th at the in-house. So this was, sorry, this was passed by the House on November 19th. 
this is essentially Biden's tax plan, or well, what's left of it. Um, this, this is what's left of his wish list for 2021 in terms of tax policy. But what the Build Better Act shows us is a reflection that the Biden administration sees Trump's tax reform from 2017 as being skewed towards large corporations and wealthy individual taxpayers. They are trying to realign a tax code with this Build Better Act to have taxpayers contribute their fair share. Look, there's been a lot of Capitol Hill drama to get us to where the House signed this on November 19. Uh, Republicans used stall tactics. Uh, the progressive Democrats held this bill hostage. But look, at the end of the day, it, it, one, it was the longest vote in House history. But with Biden's low poll numbers and the election loss in Virginia for Democrats, the Democrats felt the pressure to move this forward. And here we are today. It's been passed by the House on November 19. So what's next? So it goes to Senate. When does this actually get signed by President Biden? Well, I have the Christmas picture up there because, well, there have been votes on Christmas week before. In fact, a lot of us US CPAs will remember that the Trump tax reform actually did happen in the week of Christmas in 2017. Um, and the reality is there's some complicated negotiations that need to happen. So what will the Senate do? Well, they can take the House version of this Build Better Act and they can start with it and make modifications or they can say, you know what, we're gonna start all over again, starting you. Um, but what we do know is that Congress wants to pass this in 2021. The other thing I wanna add here too is when you go through this tax and spending bill, there's a bunch of effective dates that start on January 1, 2022. So within a couple months, so if this thing keeps going past Christmas, if this goes to you know, January or February, 2022, you know, there isn't a legal issue in terms of getting this retroactively dated back to January, 2022. It just doesn't look great politically. All right, so let's talk about some of the tax provisions and its impact on corporations. First one we'll talk about is the corporate minimum tax. Look, the White House abandoned Biden's desire to raise the corporate tax rate from the flat 21% to 26.5%. So what are we left with? Minimum tax. So this is designed to get as much revenue from large corporations as possible without explicitly raising the flat rate. And this 15% minimum tax is on corporations with financial statements of greater than a billion dollars of income. So over three year average, your AFSI, your average financial statement income will be over a billion dollars. Guys, that's a very large threshold. Um, but the other thing to think about here too is this is still a minimum tax. So you're only gonna be exposed to this minimum tax when it exceeds your regular tax. The other thing, the other element with it too is it's a global income test. So what that means is when you're looking at your aggregate financials for related and affiliate corporations, you're aggregating that number together to figure out, have I hit that $1 billion threshold or not? So again, really geared towards very large corporations as a tax toll for, for the road to recovery. The other one I wanna talk about here, the other element of the Build Better Act that's being proposed is this Pubco stock buyback. So essentially what this is, is if you are a US company that's traded on an established security market, they are proposing a 1% federal excise tax for the buyback of your stock, including any buyback that's happening from an affiliated or a related corporation. Why does this matter? Well, the thing is a lot of corporations use buyback of stock as a way to help their shareholders out. By buying back your stock, you're reducing the number of outstanding stock. You're potentially gonna raise the price of your stock. I mean, Apple alone in the last decade spent $423 billion in buying back their stock. So Congress sees this, yes, there's a tax toll, it's a 1% excise tax, but they also, see this as, they also see this as the road to economic recovery because that excess cash, they're hoping companies will then use to spend on their workforce and on their business as opposed to going out there and buying stock. Another proposed change in the Build Better Act is with regards to excess employee compensation. Currently, there is a $1 million deduction limitation for excess compensation paid to covered employees. What the Build Better Act is intending to do is to expand the definition of which entities are gonna be disallowed that compensation. So essentially what they're saying here is they're gonna take all the different related member entities, aggregate them into one single employer 
So that when you're looking at whether or not you've hit that $1 million threshold for a covered employee, you're not just looking at that publicly traded company, you're also looking at all the aggregate related companies and treating it as one single employer to figure out, have I hit the $1 million threshold? Another change, this one's actually more of a relief, not a tax toll along the way, is with regards to R&D expenses. Uh, currently, if you have R&D expenses, you can either capitalize them or deduct them. Uh, with Trump's tax reform, there was legislation coming our way that would have mandatory capitalization of R&D expenses. Uh, all the Build Better Act is doing is pushing this back another four years, which is great. That means you have another four years to work with R&D expenses without having mandatory capitalization. And if you have R&D expenses, by the way, that are being incurred outside of the U.S., uh, you'll have 15 years to amortize that uh, once this thing is legislated. All right. Now we're going to talk about the inbound and outbound exits. We're going to talk about how there's tax tolls along the way for foreign companies doing business in the U.S. Look, it's very obvious that the Biden administration wants to tighten the tax rules that incentivize companies to offshore their production. First one I'll talk about here in the Build Better Act that's going to impact foreign companies is with regards to the interest expense limitation. The House bill adds new limitations to tackle disproportionate U.S. leveraging. Essentially for this to be triggered is if you have a U.S. company with at least $12 million of interest expense and you are part of a multinational group with a consolidated financial statements, then they're adding more limitations, more than the current existing interest expense limitations to whether or not that company will also be able to deduct its interest expense. And that the, the mechanics behind that is essentially looking at their share of the total group's interest expense up to 110%. A few other changes are coming uh, through the Build Better Act that's impacting foreign companies includes foreign tax credits. There will be country by country reporting as well as a repeal of the one year carry back that we have with foreign tax credits. Uh, as well as the foreign dividend deduction. So as part of the Trump tax reform, they were trying to get the US system to be uh, a bit of like a semi-territorial system, uh, not a full territorial system as we have here in Canada. And one of the changes that came with that is that if you are receiving a dividend from let's say a 10% or more owned specified, let's say foreign corporation, you would get 100% dividend received deduction. The Build Better Act is proposing that we'll give you the 100% dividend received deduction, but only if it's coming from a controlled foreign corporation. All right, so the theme here, we're talking about inbound and outbound, you're, you're seeing over and over again, more and more tax tolls. They're really trying to significantly increase the tax burden on any foreign income that a taxpayer is receiving. This is how they're gonna build their road to recovery. Um, the one I'm talking about here now next is the guilty, so piling on the guilty verdict. But guilty was essentially created also part of Trump's tax reform as a backstop to subject foreign earnings of US shareholders to some sort of a minimum tax. What this is now doing, what the proposals in the Build Better Act are doing are more aggressive tax cuts and a timeline with regards to guilty. So there are, there's a section 250 deduction that's going down from 50% to 28 and a half percent which essentially means that guilty is gonna be an effective rate of 15%. They're also reducing the exemption that companies will have in terms of their foreign tangible assets. That's gonna go down now to 5%. And then the one relief they're providing is if you have foreign tax credits for your guilty income, they're reducing the haircut from 80% to 95%. So that means there's more value of the foreign tax credits for guilty purposes that you can use. With regards to FIDI, um, what we know here is if you're a U.S. company and you are servicing foreign markets, they're also reducing the deduction available to you down to 24.8%. All right, continuing on here to bridging the wealth gap for individuals on a road to recovery. Again, the Build Better Act, even in today's form that's been passed by House, is very different than what Biden initially wanted for individual taxpayers. He was wanting to raise the top marginal rate on ordinary income up from 37% to 39.6%. They wanted to have tax hikes on capital gains and dividends. What we're looking at now, some of the proposed changes, is a much slimmed down version of that. This is a lot different than the wish list that started with the Biden administration earlier this summer. 
Talk about the first one, uh, high income surcharge. So this is essentially an additional tax and it's only gonna get triggered when your modified AGI is gonna go above 10 million, so 5% surcharge. And then when your modified AGI goes above 25 million, then it's 8%. Guys, this is really an additional tax. And the other thing to think about here is this, if you're treating this as an additional tax bracket, there's a whole bunch of other different provisions within the tax code that are gonna be impacted by this. So for example, if you had a partnership with foreign partners, you have to withhold at the highest rate possible. Well, that rate just went up by potentially five or 8%, depending on where it all lands. Um, another thing you'll realize here too, is you know when we're talking about modified AGI, this is gonna include all sources of income without the itemized deductions. So chances are your taxable income is gonna be lower than your modified AGI. The other thing you'll realize here when you're looking at this table is that the MAGI for estates and trust is actually a much lower threshold when you compare that to individuals. So there's potentially a tax planning opportunity there for individuals uh, that are in trust and estates. Um, the trusts and estates can potentially distribute the income to individual beneficiaries, knowing that their threshold is higher and hopefully they won't be subject to this surcharge. Another proposed change is with regards to wash sales. So wash sales are essentially there to prevent loss harvesting. So it's a deferral of the loss, not a complete disallowance of the loss. Uh, currently it's limited to the sale and disposition of stocks. Um, what the Build Better Act is proposing is amending the code to apply this to a wider range of investment assets. That would include commodities, foreign currencies, and digital assets. Now, the one that's gotten a lot of media press, by the way, on what the Build Better Act is going to do to impact individuals is the SALT deduction cap. And, you know, essentially what this is is saying that if an individual is going to take any state and local tax expense deductions, the current cap of 10K is going to go up to $80,000. WWSD, what will Senate do? Well, depends. Proponents think that this is going to be a huge boost for middle class families. But opponents look at this and say, well, if I have $80,000 of state and local tax expenses, they're probably a pretty wealthy family. So we'll see how the Senate lands with this. Another proposed change for individuals is with regards to the net investment income tax. Look, this is not a new tax. 3.8% uh, is a tax that applies on interest, uh, capital gains, and dividends. What, they're, what the Democrats are hoping to do here, though, is to eliminate a perceived loophole. The way they see it is that they wanna expand the tax base. So it goes beyond just your investment income, but also goes to apply to any trade or business income that an individual is materially participating in. So if you were using that as a way to avoid the net invest investment income tax, you're now gonna be subject to it. Um, this is also, by the way, an unfavorable change if you are an individual who owns an LP or an S Corp. So any sort of transactions that you were thinking about, let's say there's M&A, work uh, that was going to happen this year or next year, there will need to be some tax planning with that because now that surcharge will kick in uh, as a result of your ownership if you are materially participating in that LP's business or S Corp's business. Um, different ways to look at that. Uh, if you can't close that transaction in 2021 and you have to do it in 2022, you might look at some tax planning ideas around uh, some uh, pre-closing restructuring to accelerate the gain in 2021. Hopefully you're not subject to the surcharge. Uh, another element might be, let's say the individual wasn't going to be subject to this because they were below that $400,000 of MAGI, uh, but for the sale, then you might want to look at setting up that sale as an installment sale and spread that gain over two or more years and hopefully not get subject to this 3.8% surcharge. Uh, the other provision I want to talk about here briefly with regards to uh, the impact for individuals is the sale of small business stock. As it is today, if you own a small business stock, there is a 75 to 100% exclusion on that gain. This has been a great tax incentive for non-corporate taxpayers to invest in small businesses. What the Build Better Act is proposing is to revise that exclusion down from a 75 to 100% exclusion down to 50%. This is going to materially limit the benefit owners have of qualified small business stock. Um, but again, this only really gets triggered if your AGI is over $400,000. All right.
onwards. Now to our last road stop on our road to economic recovery. We're gonna talk about the regulatory changes on the landscape for the cannabis industry and what's next for those businesses. All right, so let's talk about some of the legislative landscape changes this year. The CAOA was a bill that was introduced to legalize cannabis at the federal level. Um, like it's not reasonable to expect that this is gonna pass today or this year. So what's the significance of this at all? Well, the intention was to stir conversation at the Senate level, one. Two, the significance of this is there, this is a bill for the federal legalization of cannabis that is being introduced by a Senate majority leader and the chairman of a very powerful finance committee backed by dozens of other legislators. So what's written in this bill? Well, for the proposed road to recovery, they are proposing the creation of an opportunity trust fund that will reinvest in target communities. Tax tolls along the way, they're, gonna, they're proposing a federal excise tax on cultivated cannabis that would be between 10 to 25%. Um, they're also proposing the removal of cannabis or THC from Controlled Substances Act and the transfer of agency of jurisdiction of cannabis from currently the DEA to other agencies that are more about promoting health like the FDA. They're also wanting to promote in this proposal uh, interstate commerce for cannabis. The other one that's getting actually a lot of press as well is the Safe Banking Act of 2021. This is also proposed legislation that has passed the House. Um, this essentially allows for banking from a cannabis uh, related business as well as provides protection to insurance companies that are working with cannabis related businesses. Um, there's a few other cases here. There's Supreme Court um, case standing akimbo where there was a dissenting opinion by Justice Clarence Thomas worth reading through to see where things are going in terms of IRS enforcement. And the other changes I want to talk about here with regards to tax updates. Look, in 2021, the IRS issued a cannabis marijuana initiative. And this was essentially there to promote voluntary compliance, both reporting and comp both reporting and payment with the IRS. It's to provide a consistent and coordinated approach by the IRS for the cannabis industry. Last year, they also issued the 2020 IRS cannabis FAQ and industry page. And this provides options in terms of payment plans with the IRS, as well as a bit of a brief discussion of ways to use deductions in cost of goods sold when you're filing your tax returns with the IRS. Um, again, there's a bunch of court cases here. Uh, one of them that I'll briefly mention is the Purple Heart Patient Center. Um, this was a licensed California dispensary. And the big takeaway there is the importance of having excellent record keeping when you're dealing with the IRS. All right, guys, so what's next for cannabis? When you look at this map, more than a third of Americans now live in a state where cannabis is legal. There are 36 states plus the District of Columbia that have legalized it medically. There are 19 states that have legalized recreational and adult use. When I look at this map, it's clearly a very bipartisan issue. I mean, what other unifying multi-generational question do we know about in today's very polarized America with someone in Alabama, you know, very clearly agree with someone in Washington on? Okay, well, maybe except for loving Dolly Parton. That's a question all of America can agree on. Everyone in America loves Dolly Parton. All right, so seriously, what's next for the cannabis industry in the US? Um, we sense there will be a rise of large multi-state fully integrated operators, more boutique players focused on specific points in the supply chain, a lot more M&A activity. And finally, but also really important, there's gonna be a social right, racial equity component are gonna be at the forefront of the conversation on legislation for cannabis. All right, well, thank you uh, for coming along this road trip through America's 2022 recovery plan and tax tolls along the way. Look, no one knows for sure what the final BDA signed by Biden will look like, maybe by Christmas. Um, but I hope our US tax team here at Davidson will have the opportunity to navigate that road with you. Uh, to quote Dolly Parton, we can't direct the wind, but we sure can adjust the sails. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Namir. Uh, that's great. I know it's it's always nice to be able to tie in a, a Dolly Parton uh, phrase into a tax question. So very creative. Uh, up next, we have Howard Chang. We'll be talking about uh, new rules for cross-border financing. So I'll let Howard take it from here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Howard, and today we'd like to provide an update on uh, new cross-border taxation uh, rules that were pro uh, proposed in the 2021 federal budget. So the budget introduced two uh, BEPS action items. So BEPS stands for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. Uh, these, role, uh, these action were um, uh, recommended by the OECD and the G20 countries uh, to prevent uh, aggressive tax plans, basically to shift profit out of uh, high tax jurisdictions to lower tax jurisdictions. Uh, so we'll first go through the interest deductibility limitation and the second one, action two, the hybrid mismatch arrangements. So interest uh, payments is one of the more simple ways to shift profit uh, outside of Canada or any higher tax jurisdiction. So uh, given that Canada has a relatively higher tax rate, uh, it is uh, multinational corporations have an incentive to uh, maximize the amount of debt inside Canada and have the recipient of the income in a lower tax jurisdiction. In addition, uh, if the borrower, um, say Canada, is uh, borrowing the money, but the, the funds is being used outside of Canada, say to fund uh, the active business of a foreign affiliate, uh, the income that's generated by the foreign affiliate is not taxable either at the time when it's earned or when it's repatriated uh, back to Canada. So you have an interest deduction in Canada but without any corresponding income inclusion. So we'll go through an inbound example. Uh, so we have a foreign parent uh, that lends the Canadian subsidiary uh, $10 million at 10% interest. The foreign parent has a lower tax of 10%, whereas Canada, let's say it's in BC, so the combined federal and BC rate of 27%. Uh, so at the firm, uh, foreign parent level, uh, there's additional uh, taxes of 100,000 every year, and whereas Canada has an additional uh, reduction of uh, $270,000 of Canadian tax. So the 17% delta is one of the reasons why uh, multinationals might want to maximize the debt. Now, Canada already has uh, uh, intro introduced in the past uh, thin capitalization rules. So th this is to partially combat this type of structure. Um, so the thin cap at a very, very high level uh, allows for a 1.5 times equity amount uh, of the debt uh, and anything above the 1.5 to one ratio, um, the interest of which will be disallowed and deemed to be a dividend. So adding to uh, the example, we'll add, uh, we'll say there is a $4 million of equity amount. Uh, 1.5 times the 4 million will be 6 million. Uh, and given that the related party debt currently is 10 million, the difference of 4 million will be the, um, the excess and which means 40% of the interest is ex expected to be uh, denied and uh, becomes a deemed dividend. So while the thin cap rules does somewhat limit the amount of interest expense that can be deducted in Canada, um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't consider whether or not the loan within Canada is uh, within the capa borrowing capacity of the Canadian company. So uh, if the multinational company wants, they could inject more equity alongside of more debt, as long as it falls within that ratio. Uh, to effectively uh, re reduce significant amount of Canadian taxes. Now, in an outbound example, uh, so we have a Canadian corporation, uh, a corporation resident in Canada, or CRIC, we'll call CANCO for short, um, is controlled by a foreign parent. Uh, the CRIC borrows from the bank $10 million, uh, again, at 10%. Um, using that fund, it uh, contributes by way of equity to its foreign affiliate. The foreign affiliate uses this money to uh, run its uh, active business in a foreign jurisdiction that is a treaty country. So the net income of this uh, foreign affiliate is being added to exempt surplus. And when it's uh, being brought back to Canada, there's a deduction in Canada such that the dividend is effectively tax-free. So as you can see, in Canada, there's an interest deduction that can reduce taxes of up to $270,000 a year. Uh, but there's no income in the system, whether the foreign parent, CANCO, or foreign affiliate. So can Canada does have an uh, existing rule, uh, the Foreign Affiliate Dumping Rule, or FAD for short, uh, which uh, applies when a CRIC, controlled by a foreign parent, has made an investment, such as an equity contribution, to a subject corporation, such as a foreign affiliate, uh, which in this case, all the conditions are met. Uh, 
uh, the investment of 10 million is deemed to be a dividend or reduction of uh, cross-border paid out capital uh, to the foreign parent. Uh, as you may be, uh, as you may notice that this FAD rule, it's more of a anti-stripping uh, rule as opposed to an interest limitation rule, uh, because interest deduction remains at 200, uh, it remains at a million dollars in this particular example. So the new proposed rules are meant to supplement the existing rules. Um, so they restrict net interest expense to a fixed ratio of tax EBITDA. Uh, the net interest expense is defined as interest and financing expenses or economically equivalent payments, less interest and financing income. Uh, the uh, interest expense is uh, limited to uh, interest expense that's otherwise deductible um, and excludes interest income uh, and expense between Canadian members of a corporate group uh, as they do want to permit the loss consolidation within a Canadian group. Tax EBITDA is uh, defined as taxable income before interest expense and income, income tax and deduction for tax depreciation and amortization as calculated for tax purposes. The fixed ratio, uh, which is the net interest expense divided by the tax EBITDA, um, the limit is 40% for tax years beginning January 1st, 2023, uh, but on or after January 1st, 2023, but, uh, uh, but before January 1st, 2024. And uh, it will phase out to 30% for tax years beginning on or after January 1st, 2024. It is also anticipated that uh, Canadian members of a group with a ratio that's below the fixed uh, ratio for those particular years will be able to transfer the unused capacity to another member, uh, Canadian member of the group. If the taxpayer is part of a consolidated group, it may be allowed to deduct interest expense beyond the fixed ratio using a group ratio. Um, if it can demonstrate that the net interest borrow on third party debt against book EBITDA of the consolidated group uh, justifies the higher rate. Um, so for, the, for these purposes, uh, the consolidated group will consist of the uh, parent company and all of its consolidated subsidiary in an audited financial statement. Um, the denied interest uh, under this particular rule uh, may be carried forward for 20 years or carry back for three years, much similar to the non-capital loss rules right now. And in order to carry back or forward to uh, another year, that, that year needs to be, uh, the interest expense must fall within the ratio that, uh, the, the, sorry, the fixed ratio that's applicable for, that, uh, for the year that you're carrying it to. It's as if um, the new limitation had happened, uh, had applied in that particular year. And we'll go through an example to uh, go through that deeper. Uh, the rule does have a few exceptions. So CCPCs or Canadian controlled private corporations with taxable capital employed in Canada that's less than $15 million with its associated corporations uh, will be exempt from this rule. Another exemption is for corporate groups uh, with net interest expense among the Canadian members of $250,000 uh, $250, or less. Currently, there are no exceptions uh, for partnerships or capital intensive businesses such as farms or real estate. And the rules around financial institutions and insurance companies are still pending given the complexity. So we'll go through an example now. Um, so in this example, we have a Canadian controlled private corporation with more than $15 million of taxable capital employed in Canada. So the exception mentioned earlier does not apply. Uh, the tax EBITDA um, for each of the years is 1 million, 1.5, and 1.8 million dollars. The net interest expense for the three years is 100,000, 750,000, and 900,000. Uh, for group ratio, we'll assume a 30% group ratio such that it doesn't actually affect the fixed ratio uh, for each of the years because it's lower than all those years. Um, so for 2022, the denied interest is going to be zero because the rule has not applied yet. For 2023, uh, the allowed interest, again, at a 40% fixed ratio times the 1.5 million of tax EBITDA is going to be $600,000. So the denied interest is 750 minus 600 or $150,000. 2024, similarly, 30% uh, fixed ratio multiplied by the 1.8 million tax EBITDA. Um, the allowed interest expense will be 540,000 and the denied interest is 360,000. Now the denied interest in 2023 may be carried back. Um, so in this example, uh, we have 150,000 that's being denied in 2023. 
if that's carried back to 2022, uh, together with the 100,000 that's already there in 2022, that's 250,000 or 25% of the tax dividend. And the fixed ratio that's applicable for this carry back is the 2023 fixed ratio of 40%. So 25% being under 40%, the entire 150,000 of denied interest may be carried back. For the 2024 denied interest of $360,000, if the entire amount was carried back, uh, the ratio would be 61%, which is higher than the 30% of allowed ratio for 2024. Uh, therefore, only about $50,000 may be carried back, and the remaining 310 uh, has to be carried forward. Uh, the next topic is the hybrid mismatch arrangements. Uh, the federal budget has described the uh, hybrid mismatch arrangements as cross-border tax avoidance structures that exploit differences uh, in the income tax treatment of a business entity or uh, financial instruments under the laws of two or more countries to produce a mismatch in tax results. The budget mentions four specific types of mismatches, which are listed here, but the OECD report uh, has many variants of these uh, types of mismatches. And we'll go through each of these in an example. Uh, the first type of mismatch is a deduction non-inclusion mismatch or DNI mismatch. Uh, in where, where a country allows a deduction for a cross-border payment, but the other country uh, does not require income inclusion, or at least not within a reasonable amount of time. In this example, we have ACO in country A makes a convertible loan to uh, B Co in country B. Country A views the convertible loan as equity, whereas country B views this as debt. So when uh, B Co makes an interest payment to A Co, uh, B Co is allowed to take an interest deduction because country B view, views this as debt. And country A views this as an exempt dividend. So uh, A Co does, actually, uh, does not have to include into income. So you have a deduction in B Co, but no inclusion in A Co. The second type of mismatch is a double deduction mismatch uh, or DD mismatch, uh, where a single payment uh, uh, result can result in deduction in two or more countries. So in this situation, we have ACO in country A that has an investment in a hybrid entity or, or we call CECO. Uh, and in turn, CECO has an investment in ECO. CECO is considered to be a flow through entity for country A's purposes but a corporate entity for uh, country B's purposes. And in addition, country B allows for uh, consolidated tax filing. So uh, CECO and BCO can file a consolidated tax return. Um, and lastly, uh, CECO borrows from the bank and pays an interest to the bank. Uh, BCO and CECO together in their consolidated tax return can deduct this interest payment. Um, but ACO can also deduct this as an interest payment because country A views uh, the hybrid entity as part of ACO, and therefore ACO is the one that's making the interest payment. So as you can see, a single interest payment, but there's two deductions. Uh, the third mismatch is the imported mismatch. Uh, kind of hard to describe it, but probably easier just as an example. Uh, so we have ACO in country A, BCO in country B, and, C uh, and CECO or hybrid entity in country C. Um, uh, BCO and uh, sorry, CECO is a hybrid entity because from country A's perspective, it is, high, uh, it is a flow through entity, whereas in country C, it is a corporation. Say CECO uh, makes a charge to BCO, um, say for services, which is deductible in country B, so BCO gets a deduction, and CECO has an income inclusion, so no mismatch yet, uh, but uh, ACO also makes a charge to CECO, the same, let's say the same services, uh, where B, uh, CECO, when making the payment, gets a deduction, but ACO actually does not have an income inclusion. And the reason is because from country A's perspective, uh, CECO is, uh, is part of ACO. So effectively, you're charging yourself um, and it basically eliminates internally. So ACO does not have an income inclusion. So the, at the end of the day, we have a deduction in BCO, no net inclusion in CECO, and no income inclusion at all in ACO. The last type of, uh, type of mismatch is a branch mismatch. So in this situation, we have, again, ACO in country A, ECO in country B, and ACO has a branch in country C. Uh, so the branch mismatch is basically when um, uh, the residence country, uh, for example, country A, uh, disagrees with the uh, treatment or allocation of income and expenses uh, of a branch country or in country C in this example. Uh, 
uh, or whether or not there's a, uh, there's a tax presence in a particular jurisdiction. So in this situation, country C uh, does not view that ACO has a, a, a sufficient presence in country C to have uh, to be taxable there. So when BCO makes a, uh, sorry, when BCO borrows from the branch and pays interest to the branch, BCO, um, BCO has a deduction of interest, but, C, uh, but the branch does not have an income inclusion because country C does not view uh, ACO as having sufficient tax presence in that country. Again, that's a mismatch, uh, similar to the DNI mismatch, uh, deduction and non-inclusion mismatch. Uh, but in this particular situation, it's uh, for a branch. So there are three proposed rules uh, under action two um, that's being proposed that's uh, to combat basically the first two types of mismatches. So the deduction non-inclusion mismatch, as well as the double deduction mismatch. And we'll go through using the examples that we have here. So in the first example, we've inserted Canco as the bottom company uh, in this example, uh, being the one that, uh, that's paying the interest uh, to ACO. Um, so the proposed rules is if, um, the, uh, if a Canadian resident under a hybrid mismatch arrangement, in this case, uh, Canco making the interest payment, would, uh, would, it would not be deductible in Canada to the extent that the payment is not included in the recipient's income. Uh, in another country. So ACO, to the extent that ACO does not have to include into income when it receives the dividend from uh, Canco, then Canco is not allowed to take a deduction in Canada. And therefore, as opposed to a deduction non-inclusion mismatch, uh, not, uh, there's no deduction and there's no in inclusion in this situation. Uh, the second proposed rule uh, is to address the, um, the double deduction mismatch. So a payment made by a non-resident uh, of Canada under a hybrid mismatch arrangement, in this case, it would be the interest payment being made by the hybrid entity that is deductible for foreign tax purposes. In this case, it would be uh, because the consolidated uh, return that's being filed will be able to deduct um, this interest expense um, for the hybrid entity and ACO together. Then it would uh, the payment may not be deducted against income uh, of a Canadian tax resident. So Canco in this case cannot deduct interest. So in other words, if the consultant group in country A is able to deduct the interest expense, then Canco cannot deduct the same amount for Canadian tax purposes. Uh, therefore, there's no uh, double deduction mismatch. There's only one deduction. And lastly, uh, going back to the earlier example, uh, except now Canco is the parent company uh, in this situation. Uh, so where a, a payment is being made by a non-Canadian resident, uh, under a hybrid mismatch arrangement that is deductible for foreign tax purposes. So in this case, the payment that's being made by ACO, uh, the interest payment that's being made by ACO, which is deductible uh, for ACO, and it's received by a Canadian resident uh, as a dividend, then it would not qualify for a deduction that would otherwise be available uh, for dividends from a foreign affiliate. So typically, uh, ACO, if it receives a, a dividend from foreign affiliate, it would, uh, re uh, to the extent it's paid out of the exempt surplus, uh, it would be fully exempt in Canada. Uh, but under this uh, proposed rule, um, because a deduction is available in ACO, then the exemption or the deduction against the dividend income would no longer be available. So that neutralizes the deduction non-inclusion mismatch by having just the deduction uh, and an inclusion now. Uh, the rules implementing the other action to recommendations, such as the branch mismatch and the imported mismatch, uh, will be introduced to the extent that uh, Department of Finance uh, deems it to be relevant and appropriate in the Canadian context. And consistent with the uh, action to recommendations, they're mechanical in nature and not based on purpose test. Uh, they, are, they would apply to related party payments as well as certain uh, unrelated party arrangements to the extent that they're designed to create a mismatch. And there are also ordering rules to prevent double taxation. Uh, these rules are expected to uh, be implemented uh, in two separate legislative packages. The first one, uh, basically to address the, the deduction and non-inclusion mismatch, and that would apply as of July 1st, 2022. The second package would comprise of uh, the remaining action two recommendations, and they are expected to apply no earlier than 2023. So in summary, uh, the new interest deductibility rules will apply starting 2023 on a fix, uh, based on a fixed ratio method on the net interest expense otherwise deductible 
And the anti-mismatch rules will apply to neutralize dedu uh, deduction and non-inclusion mismatches starting July 1st, 2022, and double deduction mismatches no earlier than 2023. And that concludes my segment. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great. Uh, I know some very complicated rules coming into play with uh, cross-border financing. And certainly if you've got debt out there and interest and you're hoping to expense it, uh, definitely some rules to keep uh, an eye on and, and get in touch with us if you do have questions, of course. So now to change things up a little bit, we have our valuations partner, Mark, who will be uh, talking a bit about the valuation of private companies during times of COVID. So I'm sure it'll be very enlightening and uh, pass it on to Mark here. Thanks, Les. First of all, I see somebody's cell phone here. Namir, this is yours. Now, folks, I want to take an opportunity here. Let's get the camera happening, okay? I stand humbled by the tax group, specifically once. You want to So Namir joined the tax group. Obviously, great gentleman. I want you to look at this guy's sheet on top. Can you look at this? Look at this. <laughs> Now, as a, as, a, as a mere valuation expert, I stand humbled by the haberdashery involved. And I'm going to actually add a little bit to the Dolly Parton tax perspective here. So three interesting facts about Dolly Parton. These are true. First fact was that uh, they were very poor when she was born. So she was actually, her dad paid for her birth with the Sacramento. Second fact, she hates rides at Disney. Third very interesting fact is that, uh, you know that song, I Will Always Love You from The Bodyguard? She wrote that a long time ago. Actually, Elvis Presley called her up. Little, little Dolly, I want to sing that song. Dolly's here. No, you can't sing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. True fact. 20 years later, Whitney sings it and lots of money. There are lots of taxable income for Dolly. Moving right along. Now, I am inspired, like I said, from those socks, and so inspired that I'm actually going to not even look at my slides for a second. I'm going to add some new comments. And this is serious stuff. How do valuators treat tax? What do we do? Or more importantly, what do you do if, you, in fact, you want to do your own valuation? How would you incorporate tax into your valuation? Now, I'm almost a bit embarrassed to say this in front of tax folks, because it's, it's a very simple approach, very simple approach. And this is whether or not tax is being done for purposes of a CRA valuation or a litigation or a merger and M&A transaction. We as valuators simplify tax. So effectively, <clears throat> let's picture two things. First of all, let's picture how tax folks in a very simple way calculate tax. They start off with uh, net income and a financial statement, then they add back amortization and depreciation, and they subtract capital cost allowance, come up to taxable income, and then they calculate tax based on that. Valuators take it very, very simple. What we do, start with revenue, less costs, have an EBITDA. We then apply the tax directly on the EBITDA to simplify things. In extent or to the extent it's a US company, well, let's apply a US tax rate. It's a Canadian company, Canadian tax rate. Now let's talk about CCA in a couple minutes here. But for the time being, revenue less cost gives us EBITDA, take a notional tax rate, BC tax rate, corporate tax rate, US corporate tax rate, apply it, and now you have your net income. What about CCA now? So what we do, instead of having to go and project what the CCA might be, we just calculate a tax shield on the, uh, the UCC of, of, of the assets. So we look directly at the undepreciated capital cost of those assets. We calculate a tax shield using a formula to get the present value of the tax benefit. We add that on, Bob's your uncle, that's how we address tax. Now, the question is, is that oversimplified? Not necessarily, when you think about fair market value. Now, whether CRA considers fair market value or if, uh, if I consider fair market value in the context of, of emotional valuation, pretty much the same. The highest price in terms of cash between a willing and able buyer and seller in a in a uh, unrestricted market without any compulsion to transact. So effectively, I'm not factoring in the unique characteristics associated with one with with my ownership of the corporation. It's simply the corporation. If Les was to buy the corporation, he would purchase the shares and he would purchase all those tax attributes. Therefore, a very simple calculation that way. So whether or not you can try to calculate or try to do something 
from evaluation perspective yourself or whether or not you're looking at a, a, a evaluator's report, that's what you're going to see. The last thing I want to mention before we talk a bit more is what about the small business deduction? When is it appropriate to use that lower rate in evaluation? Typically, most valuators will assume that the purchaser will not be able to avail themselves of that benefit. So I always use the high rate. In fact, in most cases, I'll always use the high rate unless I know specifically that the purchaser would be another individual without any access to that. So let's go and look at the slides I prepared. What do we have here? Oh, that's right, COVID stuff. Okay. <clears throat> How did COVID impact valuation? I guess it all depends. If you think about one of the biggest drivers of value is risk. COVID introduced risk, more risk. The higher the risk, the more uncertainty there is. The more uncertainty, the more impact there is on valuation. So what COVID did is it, it introduced an extent of risk. Now, not only risk to those companies that that did very poorly. What about to those companies that did very well during the COVID times? And now that we're sort of rounding the corner, they're asking themselves, what do we do now? For example, Peloton's a good example. Some companies went down in a trough, and now as they recover, the risk is being somewhat mitigated. Other companies did really well, and now as they recover, there's more risk that they're not be able to maintain those levels. So that's very interesting. What about methodologies? The established methodologies essentially still apply. Pre-COVID, post-COVID, we're still going to look at a couple different things. We're going to assess value always using one approach, which considers three different methodologies. We're going to consider the cost approach. We're going to consider the market approach. We're going to consider an income approach. What about COVID? And what about the impact on a small company? When I say small, let's just say a private company. It could be a private company of any size. Well, it's important when we think about value, once again, to think about the drivers of value. In any particular case, starting an analysis, we'll start with a couple of things. First thing is historical earnings. In the context of COVID, how has that impacted historical earnings? Chances are historical earnings may either be artificially low because of the impacts, or in the case of some businesses, ridiculously high. So question mark whether or not we're preparing the valuation or you're just assessing another person's work, the question is this, hmm, what did that person do to consider what the impacts of COVID were on the historical earnings? Okay, let's show that for you. The next thing is we look at the components driving value. Valuation principle one, value is prospective at a point in time. So value is simply the cash flows that I, as the owner of the company, the owner of the shares, will be able to benefit from. It's the economic benefit. Not what happened in the past, what's going to happen in the future. Components of those cash flows, revenue, our expenses, obviously, income tax. What about working capital? What about capital expenditures? In the context of COVID now, let's think about this. What about the company that has experienced the decline in sales? As a result of the decline in sales, they probably run down their inventory. They're now projecting an increase in sales. It's fine to project the increase in sales. Make sure then that you also forecast the increased working capital that's going to be required to fill the shelter. So once again, increase in sales requires an injection of working capital. We're going to see that. And maybe those injections are going to be even greater than they were in the past. What about companies that did really well, and now they're seeing this? It's absolutely the inverse. Those companies now will be drawing down their working capital, drawing down their inventories, and as such, you would see an inflow of working capital. So these are interesting things. Now, in the context of reviewing valuations, which I've done for years, some of the biggest things that I, that I see, the biggest errors, are errors relating to treatment of working capital. You're going to grow your sales from $5 million to $10 million, That's fine. You've also got to buy another couple million bucks in inventory. If you fail to account for that, if you fail to put that charge in your cash flows, your cash flows are going to be understated and your value is going to be overstated. What about capital expenditures? Two kinds of capital expenditures. The first is capital expenditure we call sustaining capital expenditure. So you looking at another person's valuation or you 
undertaking your own valuation are going to think of two things. What type of capital expenditure do you have to make on an ongoing basis to sustain the capital asset base required to generate the cash flows? Sustain. Number two, growth capex. What type of capital asset expenditure do you have to make to achieve the growth that you want? In the context of COVID, of course, what you see are two things. Firstly, some companies, due to cash flow shortages, have been neglecting capital expenditure. As a result, what you might see is there's going to be in, in year one, and year one, let's say, would be 2022 or 2023, you might ask yourself, do you require even more of an injection of capital expenditure? Once again, to get that machine, to get those capital assets churning out the income, that one-time cash flow. These are big hits to the cash flows that result in big changes potentially to valuation. So once again, let's think about those. Moving on here. <clears throat> How do we treat the historical? Now, I see this all the time, particularly with, with private companies. A company might have done really, really well. Doesn't matter. I'm not paying for what the company did in the past. I'm going to pay for what the company does in the future. So in the context of COVID now, we really have to look back. If we were to look the past two years, pretty much for any company, you're going to see this. You're going to see revenues go down. You're going to see debt levels maybe increase. You're going to see difficulty. You're going to see margins eroding, financial difficulty. You probably even see going concern notes in financial statements. To what extent do we have to reflect that? Think about that. Very, very important. Question now becomes, how do you actually adjust for that? <clears throat> One thing not to do is don't slavishly link things to the market. So for example, the market did this, therefore I'm going to take my valuation and I assume the valuation is going to be. So we're not going to slavishly link it. Also, what we're not going to do is totally ignore it. So it's important to think about the story first, the narrative. What's going to happen to the business? Now, in the, we're going to talk about two things in, in a few moments. First, we'll talk about valuation from the, spec, the perspective of you evaluating uh, my work to you. So you hired me, I prepared evaluation, and I said, here you go, here's my valuation, and you're going to look at this valuation, and you're going to make a transact, you're going to make a decision to transact this. What should you be looking for? The second perspective is if, in fact, you decide to do it, and I'll tell you right now, let's skip three, four, three, four, five, ten slides forward, you probably shouldn't do it. If you decide to do it, though, here's what you should think about as well. So, once again, very important to look and ask, you have to ask me. How did you treat the fact that two years in a row we had terrible margins? How have you made sure that, that you haven't overreacted to reduce the value? Alternatively, how do you know and what have you done? How can you assure me that you haven't overestimated the recovery? Let's say that you are in the perspective of making a transaction. You're going to buy this company, okay? And you're part of the due diligence is look at evaluation of the company. So now you have to ask yourself, have we reflected the risk associated with recovery? Now, that risk associated with recovery, think about it two ways. And this, this is the sort of epiphany I want you to think about when you think about valuation in the sort of post-COVID world. The risk isn't necessarily the risk that you'll attain the growth. The risk is also that you're not going to totally fall off the rails. Think about certain companies who, whose sales have just shot through the roof during COVID times. What's the risk there? Do you think that really, let's look at Peloton, for example, just because they happen to be in the news. A year ago, amazing company. Now people aren't necessarily locked up in their houses anymore. The more, more fortunate of us in, in Canada, in the States, for example. What about that? How do you consider it? So the question here with, with valuation, it's really, it, it's really more about coming up with questions. How did you consider this? How did you treat that? How have you, how have you reflected this? Very important. Not only from you as, as, a, as a consumer evaluation information, but to the extent that you want to try to do this yourself, very important questions. 
So mitigation, that's a really good point. Forgot I put that there. So let, let's, let's take an example of a company that's done spectacularly well. And I'm thinking about buying into that company or purchasing that company. And they did really, really well. So now the guy wants to unload it, okay? And wants to get out. Here's an opportunity to get into this business. So my question to that person, to that owner would be this. What have you done to mitigate the risk that sales are going to dribble off to nothing? If there's a pause, it's a problem. Once again, what risk have you identified? And what factor has that owner of the business identified that mitigates that risk? Have they, have they considered other markets? Have they considered other customers? What about supply chain? I think Namir mentioned something about supply chain. That's, that's a spectacularly high risk. So here's a question. To the extent that your company or the company you're considering is relying on that, here's the question. How, what have you done to mitigate the risk of supply difficulties? Very, very important. Forget about revenue. What about supply? What about cost of sales? You can't buy this stuff. You can't make this stuff. Very important. Okay, <clears throat> discount rates. You know, you probably think about myself as evaluator that I, that I care about discount rates. I don't really care about discount rates. Discount rate is just one part of a story because on a standalone basis, a discount rate means nothing. Let's look at two scenarios. Oh, I see, I'm pointing up to the ceiling here. I'm here, here, down, down, we go. there we go. Oh, no, same camera, but you got it. I was watching the camera, so it makes sense. Anyways, here's a question. Two scenarios. You know, I told you to probably what I was talking about. Oh, that's right, discount rates. Okay, so on a standalone basis, discount rate really doesn't mean anything. Why? Because you have to put it in the context. Imagine a cash flow projection that looks like this, no growth. How much risk should the discount rate reflect? Probably not a lot. How about another cash flow projection that looks like this? Should it include more risk? Absolutely. So once again, if somebody asks you, what do you think about this discount rate? The first thing you should do is say, well, I don't know. Let me see the cash flow you're going to apply it to. On a standalone basis, that what might appear to be a very low discount rate initially is actually an appropriate one to the extent that the cash flows have already been risk adjusted. When you think about valuation, either from you the perspective of somebody who's going to be purchasing a valuation report and looking at it or preparing it yourself, very important. I'm using a discount rate, does the discount rate reflect the risk associated with cash flows? Very, very key consideration. Moving on, what about, what about other transactions? A good question. What about other transactions? Should you actually rely on those transactions? It's a good point. Good question. You have to ask, ask yourself this. Was the transaction, did it reflect the compulsion to transact? Think about this. A lot, a lot of, of times, times people, people will, will plan on selling their company. And as a result, they'll say, you know what? I'm going to sell this company. And I know my friend or I know a colleague who just sold his company for, for five times revenue, for example, or three times revenue. The question then becomes this. Why did they sell for that? What if I were to tell you that the fellow sold for this simply because they were sick and tired of the business and they wanted to get out of it? Because of COVID, they were burnt out. And as a result, that price doesn't reflect a fair market value. It incorporates compulsion to transact. Okay, very, very key thing. So always ask yourself this. When you've looked at an actual transaction, do you understand what the factors were underlying that transaction? particularly in the, in the context of COVID-19. Very, very important. Do it yourself. I have a little definition here. You don't have to read it, but you know, the question is this. So what if you do it yourself? It's just evaluation, how complex it is. You know, some do-it-yourself projects actually are kind of okay. It kind of works. So you look at this, that kind of works. Look at that picture. Kind of works. That's fine. Some of them don't work quite as well. And some of them 
our total sales. You have to ask yourself this. What is the risk that yours is going to end up like this last picture? Obviously, a total fail. What are the penalties? Or what, what's the problem with getting it wrong? Well, aside, as I've listed here, from penalties to the preparer, potentially, other things like extended periods to reassessment, uh, amendments to proceeds of disposition, double taxation, various things like that. Uh, you know, th th those are, are actually valid factors to consider. The, the big, big question, question is, is it really worth it? If you want to do it yourself, what you should probably consult is this information circular 89, which was actually published in 1989. And that really reflects, for the most part, CRA's latest thinking on valuation. If you follow it fairly closely, you'll sort of be on target. It's not going to tell you whether your answer is right, but at least you'll give them sort of some of the things that they, they want you to think about. Let's take a closer look. Now, I, I think this is a very important. What this slide said is start with the numbers. Make sure you have a story to support them. Actually, you know what? I wrote this late at night. I don't like this slide. What I do is I start with the story first and then put the numbers in to match the story. I can't tell you how many times I've reviewed valuations that made absolutely no sense. In fact, one that happened a number of years ago, I remember actually calling the evaluator up. And one of the questions was, so um, did you go to see the company? No, no didn't, didn't make it out there. Okay. Did you get a knowledge of what the company sold? No, actually, I don't. I think they're in the construction supplies. Do you know who the company's customers are? Not really. Do you know where the company gets their supplies from? No, no. We just looked at the financial statements. Unionized staff? Uh, not too sure. Any particular regulatory concerns? I'm not too sure. It wasn't disclosed in the financial statements. So here's the question. This fellow blindly took some information, blindly put it into a DCF, applied a discount rate, came to a number, and then concluded that it was appropriate. Think about how silly that is. You're gonna do it yourself. At the very least, what you need to do is you need to start with the story. What's the story in this case? It's a construction company, okay? It's got seven large clients and 15 other clients. There's about a 50-50 split in revenues between the big clients and, and, and the small clients. Non-unionized workforce, but they've managed to push off to stave off unionization for years, and it's right on their heels. Okay, so hmm, let me think about that. That introduced risk. Uh, let's say that they, they make uh, they make widgets, and what they need, what they need is they need that supply of uh, of, of material. Let's say that comes from uh, Africa, a, a rare metal. So once again, what this shows me is not only are they facing risks associated with, with potential unionization that's going to drive their costs off, drop their margins down, but they also have supply risks. Okay, look more into it. How about a site visit? How about explaining it? So I have the story now. So I have a good sense of what's happening. Now I look at these financial statements, or I should say now you, because you're the one who's going to prepare the valuation, you're a, do, a DIYer. You're looking at these financials, <coughs> excuse me, and you now have them in the context of a story. So this is from the perspective of you trying to do it yourself. But you can have a story, then take that story, put it into the numbers. What are some of the things you should look out for? A couple of the big errors. First one being latent taxes. So typically what we're talking about here is valuing the shares of a company. And uh, as such, the purchaser of that company, the purchaser of the shares inherits the, the tax characteristics. So for example, if this company had a factory or had a, had a, a factory located, let's say uh, on a plot of land that they bought um, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and they paid 250 grand for, and that land right now was worth uh, 15 or $20 million or $10 million, whatever the case may be. If I bought the shares of that company right now, and simply did a, a sort of blind valuation, I would just record the historical cost of that. The problem is though, what I've done is I've overstated the asset. Why? 
because I haven't factored in that somebody is going to have to pay a giant, giant whack of, of latent tax. So always make sure you go in and consider the latent tax in any of those properties. So in this case, if I were valuing this, I would look at that asset. I would then figure out what, what the current market value of it is. I would do my own little calculation, tax calculation to calculate the, the capital gain tax on it. And I would factor that into the valuation as well. So that's one of the things that people are common with this. The second thing that I see people do in the context of private company valuations uh, are the use of, of discounts. They think about discounts. So let's just say that, uh, that Les here owns 10% of a company. So Les has done a valuation. Company's worth a million dollars. So Les will look at it and say, well, it's a private company. I only own 10%. I can't sell the shares, so I'm going to throw a 20% discount on those for, because they can't be marketable. And I'm going to throw another 20% on because, you know what, I don't really control the shares. So we have two types of discounts, one for a lack of marketability and one for discount for lack of control. Now, I'm going to focus on the discount for lack of control. This is interesting because CRA has a position on this. If I were to tell you that Les only owns 10%, absolutely, and as a 10% shareholder, guess what? He doesn't have the financial statements. He can't even get through. He can't even talk to the company. He's asked for financial statements for the past 10 years. He has no, no, no sway whatsoever. He can't, he can't direct policy. He can't make decisions regarding dividends and payments. In fact, he has nothing. Therefore, you know what? We need some kind of discount for lack of control. However, what if I were to tell you that the other 90% are owned by his brothers? In this particular case, CRA has, has a sort of standing policy that when there's family control, that family is assumed to act in concert with one another, that group discount or that discount for lack of control gets thrown out. So less than 10% of that company worth a million dollars is simply worth 100,000, no discounts. So to the extent that discounts you're contemplating throwing a discount on, okay, you should probably contact somebody. <clears throat> Some closing thoughts here. Let's skip right to the last one. Do it yourself, honestly, folks. Honestly, is it worth the risk? I don't think it is, personally. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. You can try. If you're going to try, keep in mind some of those things. My last thought on COVID. A lot of times with COVID, if you're looking at companies nowadays, you'll see increasingly high debt levels. Also got to ask yourself if in fact those debt levels are even impacting the, the assumption of the company when they're going concern. That just kind of popped into mind. Just to close it off once again, do it yourself. You may save a couple bucks at the end of the day though. I don't think it's worth it. Give me a call. Thanks a lot. Les. Thanks, Mark. And I think uh, you forgot to plan this time. <laughs> my thoughts? I want to see my socks too. Yeah. We all want to see your socks too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. That was very um, enlightening. And I know a lot of people encounter those issues on a regular basis. Uh, I know whether it's shares they own, whether they run a business, uh, it's definitely something that continually comes up from a tax perspective too. So moving, shifting gears a bit to uh, some more, you know, tax technical, I'll try and get through this quick where we're starting to run short on time and, and we'll want to take a few questions afterwards. So the, the topic I'll be talking about today, um, a lot of it involves uh, rules that have been in place but are now going to, um, there's proposals to, to expand them. So the new mandatory disclosure rules. So they involve what are called reportable transactions and this new concept of uncertain tax treatments. So the overall, we'll be looking at sort of the background and the, and the current rules and how they look and the, what the BEPS Action 12 project, along with the federal budget 2021 proposals brought in. They included things like changes to the definition of avoidance transactions, uh, reportable transactions, um, the new concept of notifiable transactions, as well as this uncertain tax treatments. So a bit of the background. So the, the reason that this comes into play is uh, across the, the world, there's tax authorities that are, are 
continually trying to stay ahead of the, the aggressive tax planning, the tax avoidance, tax evasion type scenarios. So what this requires is there's mandatory disclosure rules that allow the tax authorities to target their, their audits better and to target tax avoidance risk better from their perspective. Now, Canada has a number of these rules in place and included in the Income Tax Act, um, which are targeted to these specific areas. So the OECD uh, has been working on this project uh, for quite a few years now in trying to develop uh, sort of a, a recommendations and guidance on changes to uh, tax systems that will help uh, improve this type of reporting and, and directing that uh, the audit reviews. So many countries have already implemented these, uh, US, Australia, they, uh, to note, um, they also have reporting requirements with uncertainty that are required for audited financial statements. And we'll get to this further in a bit. Um, they, there are such uh, requirements under IFRS as well, and we'll, we'll kind of get into that shortly. Um, currently, CRA has stated that they don't believe that the existing Canadian legislation is sufficient to, um, to basically tackle these concerns. So going back, this, the, the initial legislation involving this was back in 2010. Uh, the federal budget uh, introduced these new rules to, to try and curtail the tax evasion and tax avoidance tra transactions. Uh, it wasn't until 2013 that it was actually enacted, but it, it applies retroactive to 2011. So what that really uh, introduced was this concept of reportable transactions. It, essentially, it's where uh, two of, of these uh, conditions are, are in place. So a tax avoidance transaction, which is, has its own definition from a tax perspective, as well as uh, meeting at least two of three of these generic hallmarks. So a tax avoidance transaction is, is loosely defined as any transaction or series of transactions that would result in a direct or indirect benefit uh, unless undertaken primarily for bona fide purposes other than to obtain a tax benefit. So the, if it's the main goal of it is to really uh, reduce your tax uh, situation or to uh, achieve some type of tax benefit, it can fall into that category. Um, specifically excluded from this, for those of you who are involved in mining and flow through shares, fortunately, they're specifically excluded along with um, registered tax shelters. So they would not be included in this, uh, in this legislation in the old or in the new from what we've seen. So for these generic hallmarks, just a quick summary of them. They, are, they involve um, the, the whether or not the fees to a promoter or advisor are contingent on the tax benefit achieved by the transaction, um, the, uh, the amount of the tax benefit, and the number of individuals or persons that would uh, benefit from such a, a transaction or such guidance uh, and advice. The second one is whether the promoter or advisor obtains confidential protection. So, this would be um, disclosure, prohibiting the disclosure of any details of the transactions to another party or to uh, the Minister of Finance. And the third one is basically contractual protection. So if this is other than your standard professional liability insurance, if there's specific safeguards that if the individual is going to be reimbursed for any costs that result in maybe a failure of the transaction or um, protects them from having to, uh, uh, or they don't achieve the transaction benefits and uh, ultimately it could lead to penalties and, and additional taxes, they would be basically reimbursed. That would be the third sort of generic hallmark that we're, we're talking about. So under the current rules, what, what do you file and who would have to file? Uh, it's, it's called the RC-312. It's an information return. So it just details some of the information was relating to that transaction. Uh, it's required to be filed by a particular taxpayer who is benefiting from the tax uh, or, or is enjoying the tax benefit, uh, as well as any persons such as uh, promoters and advisors who are participating in the transaction. So the deadline, under the current rules is June 30th uh, for the calendar year of transactions entered. And the failure to file uh, results in penalties and a denial of the expected tax benefit that the transaction should provide. 
So the budget that recently came out earlier this year has some proposals relating to these rules. So what's new? Um, so the BEPS Action 12 report suggested that Canada's reportable transaction regime resulted in only limited reporting and did not provide for timely notification. So Minister looked at that and decided, okay, we should address some of these shortcomings with some proposed amendments. Um, the first one changes to reportable transaction rules, which is essentially redefining when the, they kick in and, and the thresholds that are needed to be met. Um, new requirement for, uh, to report what are a new um, notifi notifiable transactions, which are a new category that would require reporting. Uh, it also includes uncertain tax treatments reporting, which uh, are specified large corporations. And the fourth is extensions to the normal reassessment period and the introduction of uh, more severe penalties. So for the first one, the proposal, um, they are proposing to lower the threshold. So as we mentioned earlier of those generic hallmarks, those three, uh, instead of requiring at least two of those to be met, they're, they're going to reduce that or they propose to reduce that to only one of those hallmarks. So makes it that much easier to fall into what a reportable transaction actually is considered. The second proposal is to revise what avoidance transaction is um, defined as, and that would be to um, reduce the threshold of the main purpose of the transaction. So the concept is, if there is one main purpose to entering the transaction for a tax benefit, that could be construed as, a, as an avoidance transaction. The third one is really accelerating the reporting period. So currently you would have six months from the end of the calendar year to report any such transactions. What they're proposing to do is bring in a 45 day limit from the date of the contract or the transaction, which is a considerable change and would include the reporting for promoters and advisors. So a real significant adjustment to what is currently in, in the rules. The last one or the proposal for, for the reportable transactions is to provide an exemption or exception to reporting requirements for advisors to the extent that the solicitor client privileges apply. So for lawyers that are um, able to uh, fall into that category, they would be ex exempted from the reporting. So that's the reportable transaction. That's one piece of it. The, the second or one of the main ones was the notifi notifiable transaction rules that they're proposing. So this is a new category that they're, they're considering to bring in. Um, and it would have the, the CRA would have the authority to designate uh, such transactions. The, it includes transactions that are both um, considered to be abusive by CRA as well as transactions of interest. So these could be potential tax avoidance or evasion uh, transactions, but they don't necessarily have enough information on that to conclude. So it, it's pretty broad that the, the powers that CRA would have in such a situation to, to be able to unilaterally decide something like that to, to put a taxpayer in that position. So they do really expand on the CRA's ability to go after these types of more aggressive um, structures and transactions. Again, the reporting would be 45 days from the transaction date. Uh, and there are actually similar measures already in place when you look at US, UK, Australia, the EU, and in fact, even the province of Quebec. So the, the last item that I wanted to talk about in regards to these changes is the uncertain tax treatment. And this, if some of you are involved with uh, U.S. companies that deal with UTP or uncertain tax positions. This is a very similar concept. So this is meant to apply to uh, particular large corporations. Um, they're a Canadian tax filer, so they're a, a Canadian corporation or a non-resident with a permanent establishment and, and are required to file in Canada. Um, they must own at least uh, 50 million in assets, and that's on your balance sheet. So there are, you know, a number of companies out there that could you know, fall into that category. And it requires that they're, the audited statements of the company um, are pre prepared in accordance with IFRS. So this would, or, or anything that's relevant to uh, public companies. So US GAAP, GAAP would also fall into that. Um, and then the fourth item is that the tax uncertainty is reflected in the audited financial statement. So from 
the IFRS standpoint, it's the, the IFRIC 23 and IAS 12, uh, if you're familiar with the IFRS. And those are situations where the entity is, is concluded that it's not probable that the tax authority will accept the uncertain tax treatment. So this could have um, implications, uh, certainly with uh, public companies who are potentially in that, that uncertain tax treatment. And there's now overlap. So it's not just IFRS that's dictating it. It's now opening it up to also having a tax requirement to report these. So we'll probably see more of them as, as the days go on. So just a, a few uh, pieces to, to take from that. So the penalty for failure to disclose a UTT is, is uh, $2,000 per week up to a maximum of $100,000 Canadian. Um, and the reporting is not a specific form. It's what we call prescribed reporting. Um, it would require disclosing, you know, in a memo or letter, the amount of taxes at issue, um, the concise description of these, of the relevant facts, um, the tax treatment that you've taken that may be questionable or uncertain, and, and whether that tax uncertainty actually rates, relates to a permanent or a temporary tax difference when it comes to the, uh, the company's tax position. So that's ultimately your, you know, your position or your situation. If you do end up in that category, um, certainly, you know, reach out to us and let us know if there's any concerns. So where I wanted to, you know, kind of close on this is the, the new rules will actually override what some people may be familiar with that back in 2017 came out of court cases where they found that the attacks accrual working papers are, were, were going too far and in, in without restriction to be used in a court of law to determine whether or not that the company is, is um, overly aggressive with their tax situation. So the court's decision at the time was to support that just automatic, you know, ongoing access to um, tax accrual working papers would amount to an unfair requirement for a taxpayer to basically be self auditing. So the problem with it though is now under the proposed rules, this would override the, the court case that, that provided some of this protection. So again, something that we would need to be cautious of as we get through um, looking at tax provisions and, and you know, determining how to get there without uh, having a, a roadmap to an audit for, for CRA. So in you know, final points, um, the consultations process, uh, as I mentioned, this is proposed changes. So that consultation, for comments uh, closed back in September. Um, so any of the amendments uh, made as a result of the consultation will take place or, or take effect for taxation years that begin after 2021. So any amendments that would apply, will apply to the transactions entered into or on, on or after January 1st, 2022. So um, not a lot of um, time there between when they take effect. So it's something certainly to, to keep an eye on. So I think that that's it for that topic. Um, I believe we have a few questions that have come in for our, uh, our team. And maybe we'll start with the same order that the uh, topics were done in. So we have a few questions for Jamie here. And let me just pull up some of them and come in by email. And please continue to send in your questions if you have any. If we can't get the, to them today, I know we're, short, we're getting a bit short on time. Uh, we'll try and answer them uh, for you as soon as we can. So the first question um, with regards to Airbnb, uh, currently Airbnb is collecting and paying the PST and MRDT. Does this mean Airbnb will be collecting the GST on behalf of the property owners in Canada or the property owner still has to pay the GST? Uh, good, good question. Um, I actually... Uh... That part I, I purposely excluded from my presentation because it's quite complex, but um, in a nutshell, it will depend um, if the property owner is Canadian and if they're GST registered already. But um, if, it, if you're dealing with a Canadian property owner that is registered under subdivision D, so the normal GST system, you'll continue to actually uh, collect and remit the GST directly to the CRA, so it won't run through Airbnb. Um, but if you are a Canadian property owner that is not registered, uh, Airbnb will be required to collect and remit that GST on your behalf. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, in any case, CRA is going to get their fair share of tax. 
Thanks, Jamie. So I got a couple more for you here. Is it possible to get charged VC PST only excluding GST? Uh, yes, it should be possible because uh, they're different legislation. So, you know, the GST is under the excise tax act also on the federal side and the BC PST obviously has its own legislation. Um, normally they do kind of work and go in tandem together. If one's taxable, one's also, the other one's also taxable. Uh, but hypothetically, you could have a situation um, where that occurs. Uh, thing off the top of my head example would be like the sale of vehicles um, in a private context. Like, so person to person sale, uh, GST does not apply there, but P PST does. Um, and I believe home insurance should be exempt for GST purposes because of the financial service, but I believe uh, BC PST applies on it. All right, so I got one more for you here, Jamie. How will we be able to distinguish between registrants under the normal GST versus the simplified GST system? Um, so in those situations, um, Siri actually has, sorry, a GST registry uh, for both uh, the normal GST system and actually with this new simplified system. So if you just go on CRA website, you or you Google GST registry CRA, uh, it'll come up. Um, so under the simplified system, you just punch in the um, GST number and it'll tell you if, if they're registered under that system. All right, I think that's it for the, the sales tax questions. Thank you, Jamie. So we have one for Namir, um, a US tax question. So the question is, how does the Build Better Act proposal to limit excess compensation impact PUBCO structures with compensation paid from flow through entity? And what types of compensation other than a typical salary is covered? All right, so essentially what the Build Better Act is proposing to do is that they're gonna aggregate all the companies that are affiliated together and treat them as a single employer so what that means is if you have different entities that are in this combined aggregated group, uh, any amount that's paid by any one of those entities uh, is going to go towards that $1 million threshold. So as an example, if you had a publicly traded company that owned an interest in a partnership, and then the partnership also owned a wholly owned subsidiary beneath that, any payment by any one of those three entities is gonna go towards that $1 million deduction limitation for that covered employee. And uh, with regards to the type of payments, this has also been a reversal of the uh, Tax Job and Cuts Act, where they're now expanding the definition of what is compensation that is going to be for this $1 million limit. It'll include performance-based comp, uh, post-termination comp, uh, beneficiary payments, uh, or even a payment that's made indirectly, not by the publicly traded company. All of those are going to be aggregated together to figure out whether the covered employee has a million dollars of excess compensation. That's great, thanks, Namir. I think we got one here for Howard um, regarding the interest deductibility. So how does the new proposed interest deductibility rules interact with existing rules such as the thin capitalization rules? Yeah, so the, uh, the proposed rules apply to net interest expense that's otherwise deductible. So basically it will apply after all the other rules that will limit, uh, that will otherwise limit or restrict your interest expense. So for example, is it deductible under 21C? Uh, or uh, just the, the general interest deduction uh, limitations? Uh, or is it compound interest, if it is, then has been paid by the end of the year? Uh, if it's intercompany transaction, uh, intercompany interest, uh, has uh, transfer pricing been considered? Uh, has, uh, if it's been outstanding for a long time, uh, over two years, is it an unpaid amount that would otherwise be added back? And lastly, is it reasonable uh, under 67? Uh, there's uh, limitations such as that that needs to be considered as well. All right, thanks, Howard. That's great. Um, so I have one question regarding the, um, the last topic here. So it says, aside from possible late late penalties, what happens if you do not file the form for reportable trans transactions? So um, what the proposers are, proposals are actually saying is, is um, the, uh, the, the re reassessment period could also increase. So the, the, the concern there is uh, ultimately the, um, the, the T2 return, the corporate tax return that you file for that particular year may not be considered 
uh, to be essentially complete so that the, the normal reassessment period uh, does not begin. In, in other words, um, it will never become statute barred if you have not done this reporting. So it leaves the company exposed to tax audits and reassessments indefinitely. So it's something that you don't really want to uh, put the company in a situation of. So probably something that you definitely want to avoid. Um, so, and then I have one more question. Uh, apparently someone wants to know what color my socks are. So. Um, <laughs> what were you with that? All right, so things are getting back to normal here at Davidson and Company. We have um, a final, I guess, point. We were going to do a raffle here. So a couple of things before we get there. Um, please remember to do your uh, evaluations. The, uh, the, uh, the PD certificates will be uh, coming out along with a clip or a link to the video shortly. What we want to do is uh, draw a few names right now. Mark will... Uh, Bennett. <laughs> I want to announce the name. Michelle Seals. S E O. Michelle. Yes. All right. We got two more. I think we got two more. Dave Fong. All right. All right. And these will be coming to you, I believe, through email. Uh, It'll be sent electronically, so Bahar will connect with you. One more. Last one here. Okay, drum roll. <laughs> Darren Urquhart, way to go. All right, congratulations, Darren. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone, for joining us for another year. I think that's a wrap. Uh, hopefully next year at this time, we'll be uh, having cocktails together as our usual scenarios. But uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks to our team for putting this together. I know it's a, it's a challenge for, uh, for all of the technical sides, but uh, really appreciate it. And thanks to our presenters today. So have a great day, everyone. And happy Thanksgiving to you Americans out there. Thanks again, everyone.